Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we would love to hear from you. All you need to do is send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. We're doing something a little different today. Yeah. Normally, we open our show and we're up in our front desk. and But today, we're, we have two very, very special guests. We have David Carolla, who is the executive director of World Apostolate of Fatima, and Patrick Sabat, who's the custodian of the International Pilgrim Virgin Statue. You can go to their website. They have a great website. It's called bluearmy.com. And find out more about this beautiful apostolate. What is all of this about? Why do we need a custodian of this beautiful statue? And what are these two great men doing to advance peace and hope and love for the whole world? So, David, you're no stranger to EWTN on no, many, not. many shows, yeah, yeah, numerous yeah. years. What brings you to EWTN at this time? Well, for many things, obviously, the visitation of the statue here at EWTN, very much an honor to be part of that. And, of course, we're involved in many other things, like a new documentary movie that we have just finished that we'll be playing on EWTN. Uh, again, and there's also available on uh, our DVD here. Um, the, uh, it's a Fatima, a message of hope, because that's what Fatima is. And for people who don't know a lot about Fatima, this is the centennial anniversary. 100 years ago, simply Our Lady appeared to three shepherd children and gave us a message of warning and of hope. And hope is important. Yeah. And so for many years, uh, she, she predicted so many things such as the terrible second war. This was during World War I. She spoke about another great war. It happened. She spoke of Russia and the errors of Russia. And she said that if, if people do not stop offending God, Russia will spread her errors. It happened, okay? Mm -hmm. 30 years later, 1947, our organization came into being the, uh, as the Blue Army of Our Lady of Fatima, a Blue Army of Prayer to counter the Red Army of Atheistic Communism. That's what it was really founded to be. And it is an organization of prayer, bringing yeah. people, to bring people to learn, live, and spread the message of Fatima. And that's what our, mo our mission is and our mm -hmm. goal. So, Patrick, tell us about your role as custodian, what that means, what your responsibilities are. Thank you for having us here. Beautiful home. I, I feel so much at <laughs> yeah, home here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, custodian means simple. You know, it's humbling. Uh, I refer to myself as Our Lady's donkey. You know, we carry the statue, the historic image of Our Lady of Fatima. It's a visual catechism. It's our instrument, you know, the exactly. gesture of the church to bring peace to the world. And um, we do not only carry the statue, we carry the mission. We carry the simple message of Our Lady of Fatima. So what we're doing here for the centennial anniversary, visiting 100 dioceses in honor of the 100 years anniversary of her first apparition, visiting all the 50 states, basically calling the people, the millions of people, uh, to, you know, to realize the peace plan from heaven. True peace can only come from God. And this is what Our Lady, Mother of, Mary, Mother of Jesus, is bringing to the world. And this statue, beautiful statue, magnificent work of art, uh, is the representation of that Blessed Mother. Exactly. Tell us a little bit about the statue. The statue was carved in 1947, October 13, 30 years to the anniversary of the apparition, uh, described by Sister Lucia, one of the children, who saw Our Lady. She said this is the most uh, exact representation, the most mm -hmm. beautiful image she has seen of this the Blessed saw. Mother. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, she worked with the artist, Jose Tadem. He is the uh, Michelangelo of Portugal. Mm -hmm. So he carved the statue. It was blessed by the Bishop of Fatima, blessed by Pope Pius XII, and sent to the world. For 70 years, it has never stopped traveling internationally, at least 100 countries, maybe 150, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and it's always have a, a permanent custodian traveling with it. And at the same time, the custodian uh, is the spokesperson mm -hmm. for the message and for the word apostolate of Fatima. What kind of impact is taking place as the statue moves about and in this centennial year What's the impact on Catholic people and maybe non-Catholic as well? It's tremendous. And I think what we're seeing is just the, the, the outpouring when people come to the statue visitations. For example, this morning we were on, on a show and, yeah. and just you should see the responses that came in right away. People want the statue. They want to be part of it. They want to be close to her. They want this whole, um, they, they, they want her presence. People are seeking God. This is inside of us, okay, as you well know. Yeah. And the problem today is people don't know where. 
And they see something like this. They see Our Lady, and it draws them. Not just Catholic people, mm -hmm. mind you, yeah. others, okay? Because they understand that this is very special, and this is bringing them, this is what, what, what God wants them to see. They, and, and so they're drawn to it. And, and we see many lives, we have many testimonials of people, how it, how it just really changed their lives. So one person contemplating suicide wrote and said, you know, after, after seeing the Statue of Visitation, thought again, you know. Mm. I don't know, we don't know how many people we've truly affected like that, but I think, you know, hopefully if we get to heaven, we'll find out. Mm. Yeah. The statue's a visual catechism, you know, by, mm. by the virtue of the blessing of the Bishop of Fatima, by any other statues for, for that reason. And um, the statue calls them to prayer, to, mm. to the message of Fatima, mm. to go back to your knees in prayer. And this is what will bring about peace. If we, we leave, uh, you know, true peace that comes from God uh, among ourselves, among our, our family, and then peace will come from here and to the world. Yeah. Well, Patrick, David, thank you so much for the great work that you thank are you. doing in bringing yeah. the Lord's peace to this world. Yeah. You can go to um, BlueArmy.com. Blue Army. BlueArmy.com is the best site to learn more. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of our EWTN family. And if you have a question for today's guest, who is Michael Colopy, you send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, it is a privilege and an honor. Who is Michael Colopy? He is a photographer. He is an author of, and a book you may have read and seen, works of love are works of peace. He's the author. He's architects of peace. You could go to his website. It's michaelcolopyphotography.com. I kid you not, this man is famous, and we are <laughs> delighted to have him here with us today. Well, Michael, welcome to At Home with Thank Jim you, and Joy. Thank you, Joy and Jim. We Such are an thrilled honor. to have you. Such an honor. And with your very famous self, and humble as you are. Oh, thank you. Um, you've taken pictures of presidents, Frank Sinatra, the Rolling Stones. Presidents Frank Sinatra. <laughs> oh, you know, very famous people. People in the church, people out of the church. Uh, God has used and obviously given you a great gift and a great eye and a great heart. But how did it come about? Tell us a little about where you grew up and your, when did you get your first camera? When did you go? This is amazing. I could do something with sure. this. Well, I grew up in a family joy of artists. So my mom and dad were both artists. My dad was a graphic artist. My mom was a ceramic artist. And so growing up in that household, I had four other brothers and a sister. Um, we always were every weekend going to a gallery or a museum. So we were quite inspired by what we were seeing there. And then I really thought all the time that I was going to be a graphic designer and went to study in school, to art school, to be a graphic designer like my dad. Never had considered photography until I got out of school and found it difficult to find a graphic design type of job that was really creative. And so it was that time that I saw an exhibit of Ansel Adams' work, and it was just so inspiring to me. Somebody had said that he lived in Carmel Valley. So that Monday, after seeing the exhibit, I called information up. Nowadays, you wouldn't know what 411 <laughs> is, but I called information up for a listing on Ansel Adams. I called him up, he answered the phone, invited me to come down. And that was really my introduction into photography. Mm -hmm. And he taught me some amazing things, working with him for several months. This was towards the end of his life. And then I realized that there's no way I could be an Ansel Adams. Mm -hmm. So I was always drawn to drawing faces and um, I thought the person that I really need to see is Richard Avedon. So I saved my money up. It wasn't quite as easy to meet with Richard Avedon. It took me, I'd say, two weeks, I think, before he was allowing me to mm -hmm. come in through his studio manager to spend some time with him. But that was really an epiphany moment for me because I came back and I was just so inspired to 
be a portrait photographer. My first job was basically in an entertainment facility, a venue that brought in a lot of international stars. I had an opportunity there to meet Frank Sinatra, and he was really my first big client as a 20-year-old. Mm -hmm. However, I always thought I was maybe one bad picture away from being dumped in the bay <laughs> with cement shoes. <laughs> so. Maybe so. But years prior to that, um, I had seen a movie in high school at Sarah High School in San Mateo on Mother Teresa of Calcutta in religion class, and that greatly inspired me. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't until years later that I heard she was coming out to San Francisco to speak at the cathedral in 1982. And I thought, this is my opportunity to see her in, in person, see what she's really like. And having that curiosity as to whether she was really a living saint mm -hmm. living in our times. And so I arrived late. Somebody was saving me a seat up front. And I went down through the basement and took a corner and there she was right in front of me and walked up as if we were meant to meet. Mm. And she asked me what type of work I did and I said, well, I was a self-employed photographer. And she said, well, I happen to have a boss who sometimes can be a little bit of difficult <laughs> to smile at, but I always have a lot of work. Mm. And she invited me to come back to the house that she was starting that particular year, the novitiate in San Francisco to visit them. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was the very next day I actually came back and knocked on the door and she answered the door and said, I'm so happy you're here. You're going to drive me around to my appointments. So basically in those early years, mm -hmm. in those early months, I should say, she asked me to drive her around. Mm -hmm. And that was fascinating. In fact, I, I have to say, I witnessed the myriad of emotions mm -hmm. around her because there were people that would come up and want to maybe kiss her feet or to talk to her intimately or perhaps pour out their innermost confessions, mm -hmm. which sometimes could be a little bit uncomfortable to witness mm -hmm. or to be with an earshot of. Mm -hmm. And I remember going back into the car with her and asking her questions because the car was great opportunity for me to mm -hmm. ask her all kinds mm -hmm. of questions on her theology and how she went about doing her work. And I said, Mother, you never seem to judge anybody that comes to you. And she said very quickly back to me, she said, I never judge anybody because it doesn't allow me the time to love them. Mm. That is so true. And that's really how she <laughs> went about doing her work. And it was just, it was that opportunity of being with somebody who really and literally emptied herself completely out so that God could fill her up mm -hmm. as this channel of peace. Mm -hmm. She often talked about the thought of being a pencil in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And she could see love in each person's face. She had that great ability to see the face of God in each person that came into contact with her. And I remember asking her actually, um, was it overwhelming for her with the amount of poverty that she came into contact with and encountered? in her life and she said that I can only love one person at a time, I can only serve one person at a time. So that's how she went about doing her work one by one. Although she did tell me that had, if she had not picked up the first person in Calcutta in the streets, she would not have picked up 42,000 herself. Lord have mercy. Which was remarkable because she was only mm -hmm. four foot 10. Yes. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. tiny, mm -hmm. but had these large hands that were softened, I think, by the work that she did through so many years mm -hmm. of service. So your first meetings with her were here? In, in, in San Francisco. In San Francisco. Right. And we would spend days out. It usually was with mother and another sister in the car. She would oftentimes measure distances by the rosary, so we would oftentimes pray the rosary first. And then we would be able to converse with her and ask her questions. And these would be appointments with maybe the mayor or certain individuals that she needed to meet with in regard to the work that she was doing with the poor. And I remember one very profound moment after a day of, of working with Mother. Um, she had walked me to the front door. And in their particular chapels, they're oftentimes right situated right off of the front door. And next to the big crucifix over the altar are the words, I thirst, mm. which goes back to Mother's Inspiration Day and Jesus on the cross relaying that message to Mother that he is thirsting not for water on the cross, mm -hmm. but for souls to come back to him. So as Mother is walking me to the door to say goodnight and thank me for the day of driving her around, she paused to genuflect at the crucifix and she looked up and she said, look at him. He looks so innocent and pure. And I looked actually at mother because mm -hmm. she, it was almost as if she was grieving a spouse at, that, at mm -hmm. that point. And then I looked back at the cross and back at mother's face and she said, but look at him. His head is bent to kiss you. 
and his arms are outstretched to hold you and his heart is open to enclose your heart with his. That's the great love that God has for each one of us. Profound. So this relationship begins and is deepening there in San Francisco. I mean, she's not in America like, you know, every other day or something. That's coming right. Coming in so from India. Um, so um, you have this relationship, then she goes back for an extended period of time. Where does photography fit into this? You know, because one of my favorite books is a book by you, The Works of Love, A Works of Peace. I brought our copy. And, and it was ripped. With a all, torn cover. Ripped all, it was all the way down. I like those see books that. on our coffee table. I have tape on it here because it's, it's, a, it's a coffee table book as well as our own personal reading. And it's our grandchildren that go to this book because they see her face. And maybe early on they didn't even know who she was, but I want them to see the face because it's so, it's a, it's a portrait. It's so beautiful. And then they start going through these pictures of, of mother, but not only mother, of all the people that she was serving there That's in right. India. But I, I want to get to how did you become, how did you get that place of that special portrait artist in her life? Is it something that happened right after you met her in San Francisco? Or how did you get the okay to be involved? Well, believe so me, closely? mother didn't have a photographer. <laughs> and she often said if anything had prepared her to go to heaven, it was all the publicity. Mm -hmm. Because she never desired any of that. She would have been very happy going about doing her apostolate without any type of publicity. And in fact, when I asked mother if I could have a sitting with her, if I could actually take her portrait, she said, well, I happen to have this deal with God that for every photo taken of me, a soul is released from purgatory. Mm. So you can imagine the kind of pressure I was under. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, one time uh, when I was photographing her with a sea of other photographers in Washington, D.C., she saw me in the crowd, probably because of my bald head, saw, saw me and she came over shaking her finger with a big smile, saying today the place was cleaned out meaning purgatory no. was cleaned out with the amount of photographs yeah. taken of her. But, you know, I would say, Jim, that um, I really don't know the true answer to that. I think it was a tremendous blessing. I could see in retrospect how God planted that seed and me seeing the film in high school on yeah. her and having that interest of, of wanting to meet her and to see her and obviously to, that quest of wanting to photograph her. Yeah. I would have to say she treated me as part of the family almost immediately. And as soon as she knew it was me requesting this opportunity to take photographs of her, I thought that um, she really responded in a very positive way all along throughout my uh, relationship with her. And I always was very respectful in the times that I was with her. In fact, a lot of the intimate times without the camera are probably my personal mm -hmm. favorite mm -hmm. uh, of going into the chapel and right. she seeing my wife and kids and wanting us to kneel next to her and yeah. sharing a prayer book with her and hearing her very deep speaking voice and her yeah. very high beautiful singing voice was really those are the type of treasures that I'll always have in my heart her feeding the bottle to our, our oldest son mm. uh, but all throughout that relationship you know she was always very open and willing to have me come along and, and document um, she was always very careful about uh, not um, going over the boundaries, making sure the poor were okay with me taking photographs um, and not for them to be in any way put out there without their permission. Uh, but I would say that that relationship, you know, truly she, all throughout uh, my time with her, she was always very inviting and yeah. treated me as part of the family. Your, this book, Works of Love or Works of Peace, I know you got numerous other books, but the, the the photography that's in there, um, in terms of any of it being taken in India, like the cover picture, was that in India or was that in, another, was that in America? Or the cover was America. It was actually in San Francisco. And okay. I had three different sittings with Mother, okay. but I probably took thousands of pictures of just Mother through the 15 years that I knew her. Yeah. And um, I would say that a lot of the photography is relating just not only with mother, but also with the missionaries right. of charity, yeah. so uh, it, with her work. Because she really tried to take a step backwards and put the focus certainly on the work to the, of the poor, which without her sisters would be, would be nothing. You right. know, she always felt she was insignificant, only a drop in the ocean with her work, but certainly empowering these sisters who work so beautifully throughout the world. And that's one thing that I recognized in photographing uh, in some very difficult and dire in places with individuals who are suffering and dying. 
uh, particularly the house uh, in Calcutta of, of the dying, mm -hmm. uh, to walk in there with my wife and seeing you know, individuals at the end of life suffering from a variety of illnesses that probably could have been arrested mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. tuberculosis, uh, malaria, um, really at the end stages. And then to walk through those homes, I would have to say, Jim and Joy, there was such a joyfulness that permeated the work that they do. Mm. And Mother really felt that if they were going to join the Missionaries of Charity, they should take that vow of joyfulness to lift the poor mm. out of their suffering. Mm. And certainly that's something that I think is rare and what I've witnessed in other religious organizations that they truly took that vow of joyfulness, of lifting them out of, of um, their suffering. And Mother said that oftentimes she would relate that with Jesus' passion in saying that it was much, even much more difficult to be abandoned, unloved, and uncared for um, that was much more difficult poverty to arrest. Because in India, you give somebody a piece of bread, you mm -hmm. give them medicine that they need, they're spiritually rich, so they're completely fine. But she felt in the West, there was a much deeper poverty of being unloved, uncared for, that loneliness. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why mother, she would often say, just look at your hand, you have that apostolate in your right hand, mm -hmm. you know, with five fingers, signifying the five wounds of Christ whatever you did to the least of my brethren, mm -hmm. you did it to me. Mm -hmm. So she would call it out on each finger and wow. say that signifies the two hands. What was she saying? Say it again. She said, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. So that's something to oftentimes reflect about that's because good. it signifies the two hands, the two feet, and the sacred heart. Mm -hmm. And our love for Jesus and Jesus' love back for us. Well, you know, and the, the book is just unbelievable. Love it. It's so wonderful. And, you know, for us, we had it. Our children saw it. Now our grandchildren see it. And, it, it, I mean, it brings just a window to the world of suffering, but of love. Right. And, and you can see, I can be ab about that. And how many times she would say to people, go home and find your own Calcutta. That's right. Because it's there. You make, make this happen in your marriage where people are starving and lonely and their hearts are broken in your families and, and be about love and be about peace there. And how beautiful it was. And I always say this about St. Teresa of Calcutta. You know, the woman never had a manicure. She <laughs> never had a pedicure. She didn't have a facelift. But I was a Protestant. Unless we want to make some breaking news here. <laughs> no, right? but as a Protestant, and I, you know, as a woman, you know, you do all these kind of things. I would say she's the most beautiful woman in the world. I totally agree. And I would look at her and I'd say, what is wrong, like, what is wrong with us? That's right. You know, that, that we have to pursue and do when she was so beautiful. And what was so beautiful about her was she was never about herself. She was always about Jesus. So true. And she was always about love. Well, she always said that at the end of life, we won't be judged on how accomplished or successful we had become or what we had, had amassed materially. But it was all those simple things that we learned about throughout our childhood, throughout CCD and our faith, that I was hungry and you gave me to eat. Mm -hmm. I was homeless and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. Mm -hmm. For mother, it was hungry not only for a piece of bread, but hungry for love. Mm -hmm. Homeless not only for that house of bricks, but homeless of being rejected and alienated. Mm -hmm. Naked not only of clothing, but naked of being cast away by society and undignified. That was Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor mm -hmm. for mother and encountering each of those individuals. Mm -hmm. And in regard to, I would say, uh, suffering, mother always related that to the passion of Jesus on the cross. She, of, of course, we found out after her passing yeah. that she suffered for 50 years in regard to not feeling Jesus' presence, especially after having a vision of Jesus that basically mm -hmm. predicted her whole life uh, in founding the Order of the Missionaries of Charity, the Society, and to work with the poorest of the poor, Jesus had invited her. And she never refused God anything, mm -hmm. and that's how she lived her life with tremendous heroic virtues mm -hmm. from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have some amazing images. Uh, your book is really a documentation, pictorial documentation of really the society, isn't it? Uh, That's right, Jim. Yeah, and, and the work that they're doing. So it's filled with incredible pictures of Mother 
even in her youth, it's a picture of her with a sister, maybe? Sure, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a picture that Mother had given me. Oh. Mm -hmm. But she would say to her sisters, you know, I don't want you to work miracles and unkindness, but to do small things with great love. Mm -hmm. And it brings a story of when my wife and I were in Calcutta, I was looking for my wife in some of the floors uh, of Mother's house in, in Calcutta, and I couldn't find her. And I turned a corner of, I think it was the second floor, and saw Mother on her hands and knees scrubbing the floor, mm. just like one of the other sisters. Mm. There was nothing too small for Mother to actually take on herself. And I'm told with the sisters that she often took on the more difficult jobs, cleaning the bathrooms mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing too small. She loved the humiliations in life because that was a gift that God gave her and a gift that she could give back to God. Mm -hmm. And what a great leader she was in that regard because, you know, she's, she's teaching by example. That's right. So for all the other sisters who are watching and say, she does everything, I do everything because I'm a servant of all That's right. and I'm a servant of the least of these. We think of the Lord's words, I've not come to be served, but to be served. That's right. I mean, I've not come, I've come not to be served, but to serve, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Those who lose their lives, you're going to find your life. Those who find their lives, you're going to lose your life. I mean, this was his way, and she's simply in the power of the Spirit emulating that way of leadership to give yourself away. Hands to serve, hearts to God mm -hmm. is how she looked at everything. Works of love are works of peace. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always in the small things, though. You know, there was nothing too small. In fact, she would challenge me uh, to smile at somebody that I didn't want to smile at eight times a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm still trying to work on that one. Yeah. But, you know, she said that once you smile at somebody, you give that away and it becomes infinite. Mm -hmm. And I know how I feel if I'm walking down the street and a stranger smiles at me, it can lift me up for the That's whole day. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think Mother realized the value in those simple things that we all encounter. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she decided to give up everything. She didn't want to have the poor feel uncomfortable walking into her own home. In fact, mm -hmm. one of the most powerful pictures that I often um, hear from in the book from others is her feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and her feet were very symbolic to the Missionaries of Charity sisters. They really wanted me to take photographs of her feet because that was such a symbol of yeah. her hard work mm -hmm. and dedication. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a dear friend who spent some time with Mother, and she's one of the people who helped Mother Angelica begin uh, this great work, Jean Morris, her name is. And so she spent time with Mother uh, Teresa. And I said, what, what do you remember about Mother Teresa? Like, what? And she said, I remember sitting at her feet. I remember that her toes were crossed. And I think you've got a picture like that. That's right. They were kind of gnarled over. One I'm sure it was very painful for her mm -hmm. to even walk. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes in her mother house, she would never wear sandals because she felt that the poor mm -hmm. oftentimes don't have access to shoes. Mm -hmm. So she was very conscious and very frugal in regard to wearing sandals, being on the phone too long. She would never spend very much time on the phone. In fact, at the chapel in the morning, mother would arrive uh, even before we would arrive. And she'd be in her place in the back. And as the sun would come up through the windows of Calcutta, mm -hmm. the lights would kind of come down. Mm -hmm. uh, she would take one life, a light at a time mm -hmm. and turn them off. Mm -hmm. So she was very conscious yeah. about not using too much mm -hmm. electricity. Mm -hmm. She was so conservative and Absolutely. All that. Well, let's, let's take a break at this point. Uh, we'll be back with Michael, world-renowned portrait photographer, special place in uh, Mother Teresa's life. Don't go away. We'll be right back. More to come. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So we want to hear from you. If you have a question for today's guest, Michael Colopy, send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. We are having a beautiful conversation with Michael Colopy. He is a photographer, a portrait photographer author of a great book. You should have it in your house. If you don't, you should get it. It's works of love or works of peace. So beautiful. And so you've spent so much time with 
Mother Teresa, right? Saint Teresa of Calcutta as our new languages, as everything is happening so fast. fast. Every, who's a pope and now who's a saint and who's blessed and then we go, go, go. It's so beautiful. You got to be there, right? Right at the canonization, yes, which was so amazing. Beautiful. And, and let me just come back to you on, on saying saint. So that's a bit of a hard one for me to wrap my mm -hmm. head around because uh, we really didn't think necessarily this would happen in our lifetime. But I know mother, she was certainly a mother to me and my family. And I would say to your viewers and, and to you both, you do such beautiful work here in Alabama and such important work that mother was a mother to me, but she's certainly a mother to both of you mm -hmm. and your family and your work. And I would encourage all of your viewers to pray to her mm -hmm. because certainly she'll be a mother to them as yes. well. Yeah. Well, so, I have this portrait and someone gave it to me in paper form. And uh, because, you know, we run a pregnancy medical center and it's at, in my office, right over my desk, right by okay. my computer. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm not doing nearly the work that she did, but my heart gets broken too in the course of a day with some of our clients. And sometimes I'll just look up there and, and my, my, my cry is, please pray for me. Because right. I gotta go in room two when there's a girl who wants to abort a baby. That's just right. please pray for me. So I do count on her as an intercessor. Yeah, and certainly she will be there for you. Mm -hmm. I've felt her presence so often. I remember um, maybe about a year after she passed away, feeling sorry for myself, thinking that, you know, I won't be able to just pick up the phone and call her or get letters from her as I often did throughout the year. And it was probably three or four days after that that I received a letter that the sisters had found on her desk or in her desk. And she had started writing these with her signature and hadn't completed it. And it happened to arrive on that day. And it gave me the thought mm -hmm. that, yeah, she's still out there. Mm -hmm. In fact, she would say to us when she was living that she could do much more for us in heaven mm -hmm. than she could on earth. Yeah. And we used to laugh about that, Sister Nirmala, who took over the mother general spot after yeah. mother retired, basically to give her the helm of the missionaries of charity. And oftentimes when I would see Sister Nirmala, we would be laughing. and seeing mother, you know, working outside the gates of heaven until all of mm -hmm. her family was in heaven. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, she lived her life so beautifully. I think her big legacy truly yeah. is in the fact that uh, she empowered us all to realize that we've been created to love and to be loved. Mm -hmm. And that we need to share that joy of loving with each person that we come into contact with in the same way that she did with mm -hmm. the people that she came into contact with. I oftentimes would hear her being asked uh, what was it like being a saint or what is it like being a saint? Mm -hmm. And she would always respond by saying, being a saint isn't the luxury of a few people. It's a simple duty for each one of us. Mm -hmm. So we all have to understand that uh, we've been created for that. Yeah. Now at the canonization, there was that fabulous <clears throat> portrait of Mother Teresa. Um, what happens to that? Where did that come from? Well, that truly, I have to say, was the honor of my lifetime mm -hmm. because leading up to the canonization, one of my portraits was chosen uh, for the cover of Time magazine, which happened to be the third time it appeared on the cover. And it was the subject of the official canonization saint of, mm -hmm. of St. Teresa. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of my portraits was selected to be painted by the great painter and sculpture artist Chaz Fagan of North Carolina, in yeah. fact. And uh, we worked together over several months to get the likeness right. My original photograph was in black and white and Chaz had not met Mother, mm -hmm. so we worked quite, quite closely together to get her eye color right and her, she had a very pale type of complexion, get the sari right and mm -hmm. all the folds. And we mm -hmm. actually married up two photographs of mine. One uh, was the bottom half, the canonization office in the Vatican and the missionaries of charity wanted to have mother smiling, mm -hmm. praying the rosary, looking merciful um, in this year of joy. And when I heard all the stipulations of what they wanted to see in the mm -hmm. picture, I thought, mm -hmm. I don't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but sure enough, it was providential that, you know, could have been anybody's picture being mm -hmm. selected and to be painted. It had to be a painting because the Vatican required it um, to be a painting, I think, in the long history and tradition of mm -hmm. 
of Vatican art, um, especially with the saints. But to see it up there was just um, oh, it was magnificent. Such a gift for, oh, yeah. for Alma. And we and I. had Susan Conroy on our show right around that time, and we're like, "What happens to that? Does does that go into the Vatican?" I believe it goes mm -hmm. into the Vatican archives, and then that particular image has already gone out to all the chapels of the missionaries mm -hmm. of charity worldwide. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a, a great gift to think about that it perhaps yeah. may be involved with soliciting new vocations mm -hmm. to come in. That was always my hope with mm -hmm. the book, that it may um, inspire somebody, if not to be a missionary of charity, just to have a life of holiness or yeah. to inspire them to pray. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that we had published Mother's private prayer book mm -hmm. inside. Michael, what is it about the portrait, about a still? Um, you know, we think in these modern times, well, isn't that, you know, past age? I mean, we've got all special effects, we got video. Like, what's with a still picture of somebody? What is it about taking a portrait? What is it about the face that, like my grandkids, brought up in all this technology, but they do stop when they see this portrait of this lady? You know, why is this so important? Well, I think it's critical. I mean, first of all, referring to mother, it's great that we have a saint who lived in our times so that she's well documented. She's probably, aside from... St. John Paul II, the most photographed saint that we have in our history. But I would say in terms of portraits, and I really do consider myself more of a portrait photographer as opposed to a journalist, although a lot of the photographs in the book are journalistic pictures, I'm much more drawn to that one-on-one -on -one mm. experience with somebody. And maybe, Jim, it comes to the point of being curious about that individual, wanting to find out more about the individual. I always tell young photographers coming up that it's much more about being a good psychologist as opposed to being mm -hmm. somebody who's well-versed technically in regard to lighting. Although I do take a lot of um, trouble to find the right side of the face and to photograph or light somebody from the right side of the face. Every face has a thinner side and mm -hmm. a heavier side. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Whenever there's that opportunity of using hands as well, yeah. I'll bring it in the hands because that's another clue to that individual's individuality and mm -hmm. their expression and their personality. Well, you can tell apart. us our thinner side because we'll make sure that, <laughs> yeah. they're taking, that they keep doing that with the camera. You both have that. <laughs> but, you know, it's so yeah. beautiful. I mean, I, I think of portrait photography. What it does, it freezes time. It does. I mean, it just freezes time. I mean, I think of our parents. We have an end table with our, our deceased loved ones on it, you know, and, and portraits. their portraits, they're their faces, and you just go to them, and, and you see them, and it freezes time, and it takes all the memories of life, you know, and it just, it's good for your soul to reflect. That's it's right. good for your interior life to say, well, my children or my grandchildren have a picture of me up That's in their right. house, not only right? It freezes time, but it... It calls them, right. you know, right. I mean, like mm -hmm. you're connecting because they're not dead, they're, they're alive, alive. And this helps to, to kind of reconnect, to say this is the real reality. Well, you know, personally, I, I look back on pictures and wish I had my hair back. <laughs> so <it's>, <laughs> but, you know, you oftentimes yeah. hear in regard to fires in homes mm -hmm. that what right. is saved, what is sought after mm -hmm. most are those photographs. Mm -hmm. So there is importance with that, absolutely. And I would say with in the time of mother, uh, before really we were in the digital age. Mm -hmm. um, I felt black and white was the way to go because yeah. it strips away the distractions mm -hmm. of color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I still, to a degree, feel that way. Yeah. But now we all have iPhones or, or phone cameras mm -hmm. that can capture our daily activities and our children and you know capture those. I think we're much more conscious about the power of those things. Yeah. With Mother, she was a hard one to photograph because she wouldn't just sit there and pose for a picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I knew that right off the bat yeah. as I, it was probably a good indoctrination to be able to kind of spend some time with her ahead of time to realize that she didn't like photography or yeah. being photographed or having the focus on herself. So. What I did is I would set up my tripod and then I would have a long cable release so that we would just converse. I mm -hmm. could see as I walked to a different degree that the shadow would happen on one side of the face, which I always like to see sort of some three-dimensionality coming mm -hmm. in from the photograph so that I could just have a conversation like you and I are talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's through that then it's, you elicit some of these nice emotions, whether they're smiles mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. more serious look or something that's more thoughtful. You know, just in the course of a conversation, you can bring out a lot of emotion. And really, that's 
all I'm after as a portrait photographer is to try to capture something mm -hmm. that might be real. Mm -hmm. But if I were just to say, mother, sit and look at me or say cheese, right. or, she mm -hmm. would have had nothing mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it, I, mean, I mean, you're a professional portrait photographer, so the more time you get with somebody, so I hear you saying is there's a little psychology involved. You want to get to know the person and who they really are and try and catch that to some degree right. in the portrait and in the picture. And if not, then you're just kind of shooting away. You might not really get the person. Exactly. And I think, you know, that could come out in a conversation. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes I, I had a, a session recently with a very well-known actor with Robert De Niro. And De Niro is not, not real comfortable in that setting either. Yeah. And so immediately I felt like, okay, I'm just going to put it on a tripod and we're going to talk. And, mm -hmm. and that brought out a whole different side and a much more real exchange and experience. And I can understand that too. You know, I don't like being photographed like most of us mm -hmm. don't. And to be behind a camera trying to elicit something is a much different experience than to being face to face with somebody. So I think that's much more of a better opportunity unless you know the individual and they're mm -hmm. comfortable enough with you. Mm -hmm. Michael, just share with us. I mean, I've got a number of the people that you've done. How many Nobel Peace laureates have you done? Well, I've been blessed, Jim, to photograph 37 years of the Nobel Peace Prize. So that reflects, um, well, 37 individuals that I, I went down and went around the world, really, uh, to photograph. And it was after I did this book with Mother Teresa, I said, Mother, I have this ambition to photograph the world's great peacemakers. And her only advice to me was to be inclusive, mm -hmm. not to be exclusive. So I really kept that in mind in capturing individuals of different faiths different ethnicities living mm -hmm. in the world, and really try to highlight people who we all collectively know as great peacemakers, Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, host of others, to individuals that you wouldn't know. Somebody like a Norman Borlaug, who is credited with saving 500 million people from starvation, mm -hmm. um, and others that do very humble and simple work on a community level, not unlike the beautiful work that you both do. And you've done how many presidents? Six of the past presidents. Wow. Right. How about some other world leaders over the years that stand out for you? Well, I was the first American photographer to photograph Gorbachev and stayed in. The it's images a great, I've seen are It's amazing. a great Especially shot. Especially that birth. Oh, right. That's yeah. Gorbachev, that right? so exactly. beautiful. Yeah, he was a fascinating man. Margaret Thatcher, mm -hmm. um, a host of entertainers as well. Uh, I, I was a big Beatle fan growing yes. up in the 60s, mm -hmm. so... I would never have dreamed that my life would have taken me to the opportunity of getting to know Paul McCartney mm -hmm. and his family. And mm -hmm. he's a very handsome humble, guy. Yeah. handsome guy and a very humble individual mm -hmm. and is doing good work out there as well. Yeah. So um, it's been a, a true blessing, mm -hmm. I'd have to say. I never would have pictured my life. I never sought out doing celebrities or photographing individuals like that. In fact, I never really sought out uh, with the ambition of doing a book even. Mm -hmm. But it just, the course of my life and the vocation, I realized how important it is to amplify the work of great peacemakers out there, mm -hmm. young and small, and working in the world to really light up the world in a way that influences all of us. Mm -hmm. And it happened with a bump in the hall. She said, you're going to be my driver. That's right. <laughs> and then it's so beautiful. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and that's, what, you know, that's what God does. And, and your heart was humble, holy man. She obviously recognized your spirit and was like, he's, he's gonna, I'm going to do something for him, and he's going to do something <laughs> for me. And the beautiful story of it all is that the beautiful thing that I, when I've read about her, and, and I, we have her anyway statement, you know, when people aren't nice, be nice anyway. When people aren't loving, be loving anyway. You know, that whole in, litany. In the end, it wasn't about them anyway. It's so never about <laughs> them anyway. And, and so no. we have that with clients. And when it's a difficult client, we'll come walk out and go anyway. Right. And we all know what that means. Because you need a grace encounter. That's right. You need a grace encounter to be who she was. Well, to you, speaking to that, Joy, uh, she would oftentimes, if she had difficulty, in dealing with somebody, whether it was a head of state or some individual that she wanted to get a home for her poor people that she was coming up against some yeah. problem with, she would have her angel pray to the angel of that individual and oftentimes it would open up 
Mm. The other thing is that she believed so strongly in the miraculous medal. Mm -hmm. She would kiss this miraculous medal and hand it to you if you had the opportunity to meet her. And I don't know how many thousands of medals she handed out in her lifetime. Mm. But if she wanted to get a house for her poor people, what she would do is kiss this medal, place it on the ledge or the fence or the property of that house, and nine out of ten times, that would come true. Powerful. We saw many, many yeah. miracles happen. Mm. We're going to take a pause at this point. We'll be back in just a little bit, having a wonderful conversation uh, with Michael Colopy, a uh, world-renowned photographer, uh, portrait photographer, especially for Mother Teresa. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you are an important part of our family, and you know you could have been here today. You could have been live right here on At Home. You could have met Jim and myself. You could have met beautiful Michael. You could have had a book. You could have had a book signing with him. You <laughs> missed the opportunity. I know that you want to come to EWTN, so plan your pilgrimage. All you need to do is go to the website, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Go to the email, email them, give them a jingle at 205-271-2966. Get it on your calendar for 2017. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from my home to your home. And I have to tell you what a joy it is today to share a little bit of time, even kind of at the end of the program, with all of you and with our mutual friend, the great photographer, Michael Colopy. Now, Michael and I, of course, you know, he's been, he told you about all his years with Mother Teresa. And he, of course, was here for her canonization. We had written each other before that event, but then only met at that time I met Michael and his wife. We shared some, some great times together here in Rome. We also learned we had some mutual friends, including Father Bill Petrie. You've heard me mention his name. He is now a pastor on the Hawaiian island of Molokai. However, he spent 25 years with Mother Teresa. And um, as I said, our time was very precious, Michael and his wife and I. And I learned a lot of things about Mother Teresa that I hadn't known before, even though I read a lot. And I, I learned, for example, how that she had a great sense of humor. I hadn't known that. We know, and we heard again from Michael, how much she loved every person that she met. She cared for them with a Christ-like love. And she also made some huge sacrifices, what we would call huge sacrifices, and she would not, in her life. Sacrifices of time and of travel and of her health and, and in so many, many ways. And Michael's story, some made me go, wow. Others made me laugh, and others just kind of made me sit there and listen quietly, as he told my listeners for my radio show, These Stories. And as you can see, I have Michael's wonderful book, uh, his photos of the years with Mother Teresa. And of course, it's called Works of Love, Our Works of Peace. You've probably shown this already today on the show. And you know, um, I have to say that in, in this book, um, Michael was able to capture the, the beauty, the joy, the simplicity, and the great love that was um, Mother Teresa. And I, I do want to say that uh, this diminutive, saintly woman had some words to say at the beginning of the book, and I'd like to give those to you. She wrote, she said, keep the joy of loving the poor and share this with all you meet. Remember, works of love are works of peace. Michael, through his photos, shared that with us, and so I want to share that with you today. So that's it for today. And back to you at home. Joan, th thank you so much for such a beautiful, intimate sharing. You got a real fan and friend I there. I love Joan. Sure. <laughs> Come to California to see us, Joan. We love Joan. She gave us such a beautiful time there. Michael, our time is lady. winding down 
and uh, what does the Lord put in your heart just to say to us at this time and our viewers? You know, again, I would say that, you know, if you have that ambition to know more about Mother Teresa, to seek out the missionaries of charity in your own area. They have homes across the country and around the world, in fact. And if you really want to get a sense of the spirit of Mother Teresa, to go in and meet with yeah. the sisters and volunteer, work with the poor. And if you can't do that, to share that joy of loving as right. Joan echoed yeah. with each person that you come into contact with. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael, I often think of the apostles and when they shut their eyes after the death and resurrection of our Lord, his home going, I wonder what they saw. Yeah. You know, they, they lived with him, they saw him. What do you see when you shut your eyes and think of mother? Is it a portrait of yours or is it, what do you see? Well, I really have to say that throughout my life, I feel her presence. Yeah. And even today, in fact, I was in the, the store, the bookstore at EWTN, and all of a sudden I looked on the floor and there was a, a little picture of mother, a prayer card. And I brought it up to the, the manager the, mm -hmm. and, and said, do you have more of these? And she said, I don't know where you got that because we don't sell that here. Mm -hmm. And I flipped the back <laughs> of it and it was my picture of her on the cover. Mm -hmm. And on the back, it was a prayer uh, to Mother Teresa printed in China. Mm -hmm. And that was always mother's dying wish was to have her work in China mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. She felt her life would have come full circle at that point. So there's another little gift, you know, that I've received from her, mm -hmm. which we do all the time. My wife Alma and I have been so blessed with that relationship, that family relationship, but not only mother, but the missionaries of charity. Mm -hmm. oh. How beautiful to have that holy reminder to say, I'm here. How did she get there? Who brought her? Where did she come from? <laughs> right. But she was there just saying, I got my eye on you, That's boy. Right. It's good. Right. It's all good. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and for kind of representing mother to us in such a beautiful way and for continuing that work of love. Thank you've you you've really so much, demonstrated that here today. God such bless you. Such an honor and a blessing to be with oh, you both. It's you. a privilege for us. Bless you. We thank you so much for being with us today. We pray that you have a sense of family. Remember that in every face is the face of God. It's just veiled. It's in a riddle. Next time you look in the mirror, look for the face of God at your spouse, at your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your enemies. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.